We're starting uh, a new series today, a little series of three talks on giving. We haven't addressed this subject for a long time and the Church Council felt that this would be a good thing to do at this stage. This isn't going to be a great appeal for money, but looking at how the Bible connects our attitudes to money and giving with our hearts and our devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and then we'll dive straight into the the passage, Philippians 4, that Lewis kindly read for us. Let's pray. Oh, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a generous God and you have given us so much. And as we look at this whole area of giving now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us and guide us that I may only say that which is right and true and helpful for us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in these verses, Paul is clearly expressing a huge thanks to the generosity and the giving of the Philippian Christians. Let's have a look at what he is saying Philippians 4 and verses 10 to 20. The first thing that we notice, verses 10 to 13, is this. The model disciple is content in Christ. The model disciple is content in Christ. These verses, this paragraph, opening paragraph for us, teach us that we're to find our contentment not in our circumstances, all that's going, going on around us, or in a standard of living, whatever that may be, but in Jesus Christ. Do you see what Paul is saying here? Paul is thrilled. In these verses, he expresses his thrill. He greatly rejoices that he has heard from the Philippians. He is thrilled because he sees the evidence of the partnership that he has with them in the gospel itself. He is thrilled not because of the gift, but because of what lay behind the gift. It was this gospel partnership, their desire to help him in his ministry. You see, it's not that he is, Paul is really saying, it's not that I was miserable until your gifts arrived, but now I've cheered up again. No, He now explains in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I am in need. Materially, I am content. That's interesting. I I looked up in uh, the dictionary what content says. Here is the the, the dictionary definition. Satisfied, accepting one's situation, desiring nothing more or nothing different. I wonder whether you could say that about yourself in your Christian life. It's certainly a huge challenge for us, isn't it? And perhaps especially in the current climate. What is Paul saying? Well, he has experienced times of plenty and times of very little. He has experienced times of ease. He has experienced times of hardship. Either way, He has learnt that his circumstance is not the defining contribution to being content. Let me try and explain it this way. Imagine a dartboard. You know, right in the middle, there is the bullseye, a centre circle. Well, imagine that is you. And then there's an outer bull, an outer ring, just all around the bullseye. Imagine that stands for the Lord Jesus. And then you have the rest of the board, the numbers 1 to 20, and that stands for all our circumstances. And Paul is saying the secret of contentment is to remember that we are in Christ first. Christ is the one around us initially. And only our circumstances, our circumstances therefore, everything that goes on around us is outside of Christ, is secondary. So that whatever our circumstances, whether want or plenty, whatever is thrown our way, we look for our contentment in what we have in Jesus first and foremost. So it's a 
good question to be asking ourselves, isn't it? Do we believe that's what we have in Christ? Is our contentment tied to that inner circle of what we have in him now and in the future? Interestingly, that's really what Petoni was teaching us last week, wasn't it? In Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I want for nothing because Jesus is my shepherd. Or is our contentment tied to that larger circle of circumstances, whether they're good things, hard things, difficult things or brilliant things, And if they're tied to them, we will go up and down, won't we? In our current circumstance, of course, this may be a really a real time of challenge, of tension, of difficulty. We will look to the circle around the bullseye and see Christ. Will we look at that circle around and see Christ? Or will we look at the circumstances all around to find our contentment? Or lack of it, even anxiety or fear. And you see, when our eye is on Christ, we then can echo Paul's confidence of verse 12. Do you see that? I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. What a wonderful place for us to get to. Now, Paul has, a, I think, two points of great application for us in verses 12 and 13. Notice the first one there. Contentment is something learned. Paul is saying, second half of 12, I have learned the secret of being content. It's not something that just came. He's learnt it. You see, especially when sometimes God causes us to be in want, to teach us not to tie our contentment to all those circumstances around. But he teaches us it's something to be learnt, to trust in Jesus for all things. And the second thing is contentment brings a confidence. In verse 13, in its context, I can do everything can only mean I can live in every circumstance. I can find myself, uh, myself in knowing the Lord. Every circumstance I find myself in, knowing the Lord will give me the strength to come through it. So these point verses, you see, are pointing us to trust in Jesus. But what, are that, what has that got to do with giving and money? Well, I think these verses help us, you see, to have our mindset, our trust and our priority on Jesus, on Jesus and his purposes and not on our circumstances. And that will include our giving. So there's the first thing. The model disciple is content in Christ. Secondly, the model church partners in the gospel. Verses 14 to 18. You see, in these verses, they teach us that as Christians, we are partners in the business of getting the gospel to others. And that includes a financial partnership that Paul is showing here in these verses. Paul's just said that his contentment is not tied into his circumstances, not even with the arrival of the Philippians gift. And he realises that's open to misunderstanding, that he wasn't somehow grateful not true at all. Paul is thrilled with the gift because it shows their partnership with him and it reveals their hearts that long to see the gospel grow. That's the thrust of verses 14 to 16. You see, Paul is a church planter. Sometimes he supported himself financially through tent making. Other times, of course, like when he received the gift from the Philippians, he was able to invest all his time and work for the gospel. And that's what's happening when in verse 15 he sets off from Macedonia, where Philippi was, to take the gospel elsewhere. See, that's the financial side of the 
partnership in the gospel, which Paul is on about in these verses. Look at verse 15. We have this sad example, and sometimes we learn the point more clearly, don't we, when we see the negative. And it is that often Christians don't realise their responsibility in this. Do you see what Paul says? Not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. You see, others just didn't realise that part of their Christian discipleship, part of being a church family, is that they give so the gospel can grow. But the great example at the start of verse 15 is how the Philippians understood right from the start of their Christian lives that to be a Christian is to be a partner in the gospel business, including being a financial partner. Paul is not playing on people emotionally, but the real issue is the spiritual barometer and giving uh, of seeing people longing for the gospel to grow and giving to enable that to happen. Do you see what he's saying? It's not that I'm fishing for your money, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account, he says. He's in imagining some sort of account sheet of how the Philippians are doing spiritually and he longs for them to be doing really well spiritually, to be in a really good place. And he is saying the number one thing about this gift is not that it pays for me, although it did. The number one thing about this gift is that it shows genuine spiritual fruit in your lives. And that's what thrilled Paul. Then in verse 15, uh, verse 18, he just gives a richness in giving this illustration of sacrifice, the offering of a sacrifice to God. The number one thing about this gift is that it shows a genuine response to God and a genuine sense that all you have is yours anyway. And so the idea of a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, something that is pleasing to God is steeped in the Old Testament. And there were sacrifices of sin, yes, but there were also sacrifices of thank offerings. These were a means by which worshippers could say, thank you to God for what he had done for them. And as they responded in that way, and ar the aroma of the sacrifice would go rise up to God. And because it came from an obedient, grateful heart, it was a pleasing aroma to God. Now, do you see how Paul now ties that idea into them giving to his ministry? The logic of the verses becomes very powerful indeed. As the Christian grows in gratitude and appreciation of all that God has done, then the driving force of their priorities is the growing of the gospel, supporting gospel ministry. And when we get that, our financial giving, whatever it is within our means, becomes a pleasing aroma to God. Then thirdly and finally, in verses 19 and 20, the glorious God who abundantly meets our needs. You see, in 19 and 20, we're shown that as we give, there's no call to be anxious about our own needs. It springs out of a heart of longing to see the gospel grow and a heart of obedience and you see, having said in verse 18 that uh, Paul says his needs were amply supplied. Now that I have received from Aphrodite uh, the gifts you sent, Paul goes on to reassure them about their own needs. His needs have now been met, but he wants to reassure them of their own needs. Do you see that in verse 19? And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ. Nothing is going to be left wanting. Do you remember the picture of the dartboard? 
us right in the bullseye and then Jesus Christ in that uh, that uh, little circle all around the bullseye and then surrounded by the rest of the board of circumstances well the non-christian world you see because they don't know Christ what do they do the non-christian sees him or herself in the bullseye and immediately surrounded by their circumstances, often hostile, often unpredictable. So where do you find your security in that situation? Well, our culture's answer is to surround yourself with a financial buffer or a security cushion. And if you see these things through the world's lenses, then giving is utterly crazy, isn't it? Because giving is depleting your buffer taking the filling out of your financial cushion to which Paul says but we don't see things as the world sees them our little outer bull is Jesus Christ and he's got us he's keeping us safe that's what 19 and 20 are all about the Bible often uses that phrase, glorious riches, to refer to God giving his son to die for us on the cross. And of course, it doesn't make sense, does it, to say, oh, I believe God gave his most precious possession, Jesus, to meet my greatest need, the forgiveness of sins. But then to doubt his willingness or his ability to look after my lesser needs. No, God is totally able to care for you in every situation. I don't know whether you've watched any of the Superman films, but at the beginning of one of them, there was Lois Lane's helicopter has crashed at the top on top of a skyscraper and she's hanging on to something for dear life and suddenly gives way and she's free falling down towards the horrified crowd. And suddenly Superman zooms up from the pavement and catches her and continues to glide back up to the helipad with Lois safely in, her, in his arms. And he says to her, don't worry, miss, I've got you. And he takes a look down and she takes a look down and she swallows hard and says, you've got me, but who's got you? Well, because she hasn't realised that Superman is in the Hollywood worldview, ultimate security. His are the ultimate arms to be in, you see. And the point that Paul is making in verse 19, God has got us. And he, in the real world, is our ultimate security. It may be that we're in want right now and needing to trust God for so much more than we've ever had to before. But whether we're in a time of plenty or a time of want, we all need to trust God for his, in this whole business of giving. Because the temptation, you see, for us is to think that giving is losing my security. Not so, says Paul. With that glorious verse in verse 18, giving to gospel concern, you see, is a fragrant offering. It is an acceptable sacrifice and the aroma is pleasing to God. As we give, it'll become a great blessing to us because it pleases our heavenly father who we serve. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you have provided for all our needs at St. James's over the years. You have grown this fellowship and people have come to a living faith in you and we praise you and thank you for this. Even in these strange days, please help us to have our eyes fixed on you that we may be obedient to your ways. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I've just popped up a, a few questions that well, there will be on, uh, in just a moment, a few questions up on the, on the screen that you might like to think through and pray about 
uh, with your house group when you meet this week. Just stimulate discussion for you to practically put into place the things that you've learned.